All right, guys, we're talking river epoxy boards today. We're going to show you step by step how to build these, starting with creating the form, even what release agent to use. And it's a really easy project, especially if you plan out the size of your boards for the planer that you have available. Stick around, we're jumping right into it. Build yourself a little melamine frame, sized exactly for your project, pre-drill for screws, and go ahead and assemble it. So then just seal off the container that you've made with some house wrap tape. What I like to do is just fold it in half, push it down onto the bottom of the box, and then just use a little scrap of wood to make sure that it gets all the way into the corner. Because if it doesn't, that will keep you from getting your project workpiece in there. And once you're all the way flat into the corner, just fold the tape up. Just cut yourself a short length of tape, fold it into the corner. Again, use your little wood tool Try to flatten that out, out into the corner before it adheres to the adjacent piece. Cut down along the seam and just fold your edges down. That just gives you a little extra insurance at the corners so the epoxy won't leak out. Okay, and then there's a quick and easy way to determine what volume, how many ounces you need of the epoxy to fill this void. And the first thing you do is just make a mark every two inches along one of your panels, and then just get an average width measurement. And instead of taking it at the top or at the bottom, just assume you're taking the measurement halfway down the thickness of the slab, and you'll be really accurate, very close to your actual number. So on our oak epoxy board example here, we've got one inch thick material. And so the volume calculation we're starting with is average of three inches wide by one inch deep by 16 inches long. And when we plug that into the volume calculator, we're getting between, what is it, 27? 26. Between 26 and 27 ounces as the required volume. So if you mix up about 30 ounces and you have a couple left over, you'll be in good shape. Don't forget to use some sort of a mold release. We're using Smooth On Universal Mold Release. Um, there's probably a lot of products that would work as a release agent. This is just what we have experience with. Spray it on, wipe it back, and maybe apply a second coat as needed. And we'll just mix a little bit of this two-part epoxy to uh, use as a edge sealer. Just filling in some of the worm holes on the sap wood of this white oak. And this is on the underside of the project before we flip things over and go ahead and do the edge seal treatment. Okay, so we'll go ahead and flip the oak pieces over so we can do that edge sealing. You want to have a pretty tight fit into your form. And you also want to make yourself some little calls from scrap wood and just make sure to wrap those with the Tyvek tape or some packing tape so you can clamp everything down before you do the pour. So she's just working to fill in any of the larger wormhole voids with the applicator. So it's just a matter of brushing out the epoxy sealer, letting that cure for 12 hours or overnight. And once that's dried and it's not too tacky anymore, you can go ahead and complete the pour with the colorant. So knowing that the epoxy can shrink a little bit as it dries, we decided to mix up a, a very small amount of green colored epoxy 
uh, with the mica in it and we're just going to do a first fill on some of these deep worm holes and we know that will shrink back a little bit so on the main pour we'll go ahead and top those up. We found some really neat texture on the white oak once the bark was removed and after wire brushing it, it still has a neat color and maintained a lot of that texture. So it's an interesting look. Okay, so we're just mixing up the two-part epoxy for the main pour. Key thing is just mix it thoroughly uh, before you start adding your colors. All right, we'll mix this up for a full five minutes before we add the color and get ready to pour. So we're just adding green mica colorant. Just go sparingly with that, a little goes a long way. Mix it up well and you can always add more colorant as desired. So our process here is we're going to just add green to the first half of the pour. And once we fill the mold about halfway up, then we'll add pearl white um, as desired. A little bit less intense on the pearl white, but just to give it some accent. And we'll go ahead and top up the mold with that. You need to stir in the mica thoroughly and then let it sit for several minutes to let the bubbles escape before we go ahead and do that first pour. So we've got about 31 ounces of epoxy total here and we wound up doing uh, four of the little scoops and so it, it doesn't take much but you can just keep adding the colorant as desired until you get that nice rich green emerald color that we're after. While the bubbles are rising up out of the epoxy, just take a minute to level the form in both directions. If you're not level, just use little wooden wedges to level the box. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do the first pour. Uh, she's got a lot of nice, this emerald green mica stirred in, uh, but none of the pearl white yet. And so the goal is just to get this all halfway or at least partway filled up fill that channel between the two pieces of white oak. So you need to use some heat source to flame out the bubbles and when it's low in the pour like this I don't mind using a heat gun. It generates a lot of heat so it can pull those bubbles up to the surface. Oh, on the second pour I'll probably switch to a little uh, butane powered torch uh, just because it doesn't move the epoxy around as much but um, both will do a decent job at quickly removing the bubbles from the epoxy. So that green looks quite pretty on its own. It's just a judgment call if you want to try to add any of the white pearl. Um, we're guessing that uh, one scoop of white pearl compared to four scoops of the emerald green uh, will give us the look that we're after. Just give it some subtle variation to the top layer uh, of course, nature always has some variation to it, and that's we want it to look like a, a river or a lagoon. So it's kind of a neat idea to add a little bit of white pearl to the second pour. But again, we're doing this all wet. The bottom layer is still wet. We're mixing in some pearl and just topping it off. So as we're waiting for the bubbles to rise up out of the second pour, she's just going to top up these little lakes that are alongside the river, I guess. <laughs> and uh, we had pre-filled those a little bit because they were deep and we were concerned there'd be continuous bubbles coming up out of that area. And, and you have to realize that epoxy does shrink back somewhat. So if you have little pockets like that, you might fill in two pours. But this little applicator has been super handy just to top up these little wormholes. And here's the second pour with the pearl added. It's a subtle difference, but it does give you a little extra pizzazz in the colorant of the epoxy. And so just the way that you pour it and mix it in determines the final look that you get. We seem to be of the opinion that once you pour it in, just play with the, the shape and the texture of it by using flame and not so much stir sticks. It seems to be the way we get success, but if you want to dip a stir stick in there and, and play with the look of it, by all means, that's, that's kind of part of the creative process with it. So here's where I'll switch to a, a small cooking torch. It just doesn't push the epoxy around like the heat gun can, but it still does a good job of releasing the bubbles off the top of the, the skin of the epoxy here. 
We'll run a box fan over the epoxy for a while as it begins to cure, especially if you're getting any kind of an exothermic reaction. And always check that the type of epoxy you use is appropriate for deep pours. So you can pull your clamps off the forearms and if you get lucky you might just be able to tap it out with a rubber mallet. We've had some success with this. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. There we go. Even on the back side it doesn't look too bad but the front side's got the appearance that we're going for for the show side. We'll pop that green one out and we'll run these through the planer. So you can use a random orbit sander to work through the grits all the way up through 400 with the random orbit sander. And then once you get up to the finer grits, you'll go ahead and wet sand it. The finish of the epoxy looks a little dull until you get the water on there for wet sanding, and then it really shows the color. guys that wasn't too bad even with applying the finish here we used a Watco Danish oil in a natural color and then I actually sprayed on two coats of pre-catalyzed lacquer of course a little scuff sanding between coats will help keep everything nice and smooth this board we actually did a little bit different we actually used white oak for this board and decided to fume the project and so we used 28 percent ammonium in a rolling beach cooler. And that forms an airtight chamber, about 12 to 14 hours in the chamber, and that can give you this nice decorative effect. There are some safety precautions working with ammonia. You'll have to read up and research on that. That's certainly not the focus of this video. But the net effect here is this lighter color on the sapwood of the white oak, and then this deep nut brown color of the heartwood. So that's a fun look if it's something you want to experiment with. So maybe this is something you want to give a spin in your own shop. Hopefully you get a chance to try some of these river epoxy boards yourself. I think they're a fun little project. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.